Welcome, everyone. Thanks for, for joining today. Um, uh, let me introduce our speaker. I'm Zach Edelman. I'm the executive director with LADCO. Today, we're going to be talking about um, ozone chemistry and particularly um, ozone chemistry um, in the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, however, there's some applicability of this work um, to all areas of the country. Um, and our, our speaker, uh, Dr. Angie Dickens, and is our uh, the LADCO data scientist. And, and Angie's been doing some work on using um, different methods to identify um, ozone formation chemistry, um, NOx and VOC sensitivity. And she's going to be presenting this work um, today. Um, Angie has worked at LADCO since uh, October 2020. Um, before she was here at LADCO, she was at uh, Wisconsin uh, DNR. She worked for the state of Wisconsin. Um, she also served uh, in the U.S. EPA's Office of Transportation and Air Quality as a science policy fellow and as, a, and as an assistant professor um, at Mount Holyoke College um, as a professor of environmental chemistry. Um, Angie has a Ph.D. from the U University of Washington and a B.A. from um, Carleton College, both uh, in chemistry. Um, so, yeah, it's great to, to be presenting this to you all. This is work I've been doing over the last few years. We wrapped this up into a report that we released in September. Um, things were pretty nuts then, so didn't get around to doing a real um, formal seminar on this, webinar on this. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to be doing this now. This is work I've done looking at ozone formation sensitivity um, to NOx and VOC emissions in the LADCO region. And it's that work I've been doing in collaboration with Zach, um, as well as with Single Nergui and Mark Jansen at LADCO. And the satellite portion of this was done in collaboration with Gerald Octon and Brad Pierce at the University of Wisconsin. And Motivation for this is that we have a number of areas in the Great Lakes states that are violating the 2015 ozone national ambient air quality standard. And these states are developing attainment demonstrations to show how they'll bring their areas into attainment of the standard. And these attainment demonstrations have to include control measures to you know, lower ozone if they're not modeled to attain the standard. And we have several areas that are not modeled to attain the standard. So they really the really core question of whether they're going to get whether it's going to be most effective for them to control NOx or VOCs, and you know obviously want to do want to target the pollutant that's going to have the biggest impact, and so there's a sort of fundamental question of which you know is ozone formation sensitivity um, ozone formation sensitive to NOx or to VOCs or to both? So which is going to be most effective? And this is something that. Um, no one had really looked at recently, and that's actually that's changed in the last like year or two. There have been um, a few studies coming that came out in the last year or two that looks at this question. LADCO and Wisconsin DNR had actually also contracted for several studies, um, so there's been some some more recent work at this. But I've basically been looking at this from any angle I could myself, and then I combined my interpretation um, with the the results from the other recently published studies into this report here, which is which is linked on this page. It's a pretty hefty report. I think it's like 167 pages with significant appendices as well. But um, I think it's it does a, I think it does a nice job of synthesizing everything. <laughs> um, so this is what we're talking about. These are the areas we're talking about. This is the Ladco region, six state Ladco region, and we have all the areas shown in pink are areas that are currently non-attainment for the 2015 standard. So we have a bunch of areas around Lake Michigan, which has traditionally been our, our worst ozone area has been around Lake Michigan. It's been true for decades. Uh, we have a few maintenance areas up at the northern end of the lake. We also have St. Louis, Detroit, Cleveland that are all non-attainment, as well as Louisville, Cincinnati, and Columbus that are maintenance for the standard. So we have kind of all these areas that are having to work on these, these attainment plans and really be very helpful to know um, which pollutant to go after. So what I want what I'm going to do today is I want to step through the approaches I took to for the in the study and there were five approaches. Three of them focus on use of formaldehyde to NO2 ratios and ozone exceedance days and I, I got those ratios from three different sources, three different data sources. So one is ground monitors, another is the tropomia satellite, and a third is from our LADCO modeling at, at 12 kilometer. And then I have two other types of really different types of approaches. One is to look at do a weekday weekend analysis. And the other is to glean what insights I could from trends in ozone over space and time. And I'll explain what each of these approaches mean when we get there. So to step through each of these and kind of look at what we what our conclusions are generally and really focusing on one or two areas in more detail just as a demonstration. 
And then at the end, I'm going to examine the findings for each non-attainment and maintenance area and draw some overall conclusions. So looking at formaldehyde to NO2 ratios as indicators, the idea behind this approach is that formaldehyde is formed from oxidation of VOCs and as well as from primary sources. Um, so the mo we think it's mostly from oxidation of VOCs. And so the amount of formaldehyde is roughly proportional to summed reactions of all VOCs with the OH radical. NO2, of course, is an ozone precursor, which forms um, ozone via reaction with VOCs. So the idea is that the ratio of formaldehyde to NO2 is basically a reactivity weighted measure of VOC of the VOC to NOx ratio. And theoretically, it reflects the relative availability of NOx and total VOC reactivity to the, of the OH radical. So if you have high formaldehyde or, and or low NO2, that's going to give you a high ratio. And that's going to mean that NOx is limiting. So basically, we have more formaldehyde than we have NOx, you know, relatively. So we have um, NOx is kind of more precious. It's going to be limiting things because it's less available. And the reverse is true also. So if you're low formaldehyde and relatively high NOx, you know, one or the other or both, you get a low ratio and, you know, lower formaldehyde, lower VOC. So VOC is going to be limiting or, you know, it's going to be sensitive to VOC formation. So, you know, we have this formaldehyde to NO2 ratio and we have, you know, we have a spectrum between high ratios and low ratios here. So if you have high ratios, you're NOx sensitive, you know, high ratios, you have more VOC to NOx. So you mean NOx sensitive, low ratios, the reverse, you mean VOC sensitive. And in between, like there, there is a range in which the ozone formation chemistry is sensitive to both NOx and VOCs. So if you lower VOCs, ozone will decrease. If you lower NOx, VOCs will decrease. So we call that the transitional chemistry range. And what we really need to do, what's really most helpful in interpretation is to, to apply cut points to separate the different chemistry reg regimes and say ratios higher than a certain level are NOx sensitive, you know, ratios lower than a certain level are VOC sensitive. Um, the trick is it's really complicated to determine these cut points and the, the choice of cut point has a really big impact on how you interpret um, the chemistry. And, you know, I talked about we're using ratios from ground monitoring, from satellite, from models. We really need to use a different cut point for each type of measurement, you know, to do with it has to do with the time period. So some of these are 24 hour, most of the ground monitoring is 24 hour averages. That includes nighttime measurements, you know, versus a satellite which passes over at 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, location and measurement, satellite measurements are, are measuring the whole column versus a ground-based measurement, you know, the averaging period measurement biases, there's, there's all these different things. So we, um, the ratios that, the ratio cut points we think are most appropriate and that we applied here um, are from these different sources. So ground monitoring is from this Blanchard, this is a report to LAGCO. Modeling is this Duncan 2010 paper. Satellites is Jen et al. 2020 paper. So we have, you know, the lowest ratios for ground monitoring, point, less than 0.3 is VOC sensitive, greater than one is NOx sensitive. One and two for modeling, 3.2 um, to 4.1 for the satellite. So I'm going to apply different ratio cut points. And the conclusions are very sensitive to the choice of cut points. And um, there's a lot of uncertainty, as I said, from in the choice of cut points. So I'm going to start with looking at ground-based formaldehyde to NO2 ratios. These are in some ways the most straightforward because they're based on direct measurements. So you don't need complex models or algorithms. You just go out there and measure formaldehyde measure NO2, which of course is not simple, <laughs> but we don't have to, in the, the processing, we don't, it doesn't require a lot of processing. Um, so that's one big advantage. It's also measured at nose level, at, at ground level where people are actually breathing. So it's most directly in, um, relevant to human health. Disadvantages of this is that um, we don't have many measurements. Measurements of formaldehyde in particular, but also NO2 are very sparse spatially and temporally. And pretty much all the measurements in the lag curve region are in urban areas. This shows all the places where we have formaldehyde to NO2 ratios during the years 2016 to 2021. And you see we have, I think, seven measurements. We have one in St. Louis, three in the Chicago area, one in Milwaukee, Grand Rapids, Detroit. That's it. That's the whole, all the availability we have for formaldehyde to NO2 directly measured in lag code during this time period. Another limitation is that most of the formaldehyde measurements are 24 hour averages made every few days. Often it's one in six days. So very um, sparse 
uh, temporal coverage. And it also means we just don't have that many samples. So, you know, they're often measured uh, June through August for the PAMS station. So we have, you know, a, a few dozen me measurements per summer. Um, ratios are also, you know, they're 24 hour averages, so they're not focused on the hours of peak ozone. And uh, true, the Intel, a lot of places have shifted to measuring true NO2, but previously the NO2 measurements were often biased high, which meant the ratios are biased low. That said, um, this is this is the data we have. So this is a pretty complicated figure, but what we're looking at is we're looking at ground-based formaldehyde to NO2 ratios on days with MDA8 ozone greater than 60 parts per billion. So I did this also with looking at MDA8 greater than 70 parts per billion. In other words, exceedance days, the days that were exceeding the standard. The problem is that like there just aren't that many measurements. Um, like I said, there aren't that many days per summer where we measure them. Um, and there aren't that many days with the ozone over 70 ppb. So I think 60 ppb is a good compromise between looking at relatively high ozone and actually getting getting enough data to oops to interpret things. The y-axis is formaldehyde to NO2 ratio. The x-axis is the year. So I, I average the years together again to give enough data. I'm going back to the early 90s. So we have five-year periods from starting 1991, ending in 2021. Uh, for Chicago, Detroit, Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan mostly includes Milwaukee, uh, two Milwaukee sites, and then one in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and St. Louis. And what we see is that, first thing I want to point out is um, in most places the ratios are going up, right? Or pretty much everywhere the ratios are going up, up over time. So we're starting in this, in the gray lines are the cut points. So we're starting off in VOC sensitive territory in most places. Starting off VOC sensitive in Chicago, around Lake Michigan, um, in Detroit, and we're moving into the transitional range. So that's true for basically everywhere. Um, it's also notable that the Chicago region had the lowest ratios, with the exception of the Chicago Jardine site. Um, but it had like the lowest ratios down around 0 0.15, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, 0 0.2. Um, the other sites are a little, little higher. Um, and there's really very little evidence of NOx sensitivity from this measure. It's also very important to note that all of these sites are in urban cores. So all these sites are going to be at kind of their most, the most VOC sensitive um, that we find in the whole area. So that's that's basically all I have for the ground-based measurements. We just don't have that much data. But shifting gears and to look at trophoblomy satellite formaldehyde to NO2 ratios. Um, the advantages of satellite measurements, of course, is you have really good spatial coverage, you know, spatial coverage of the entire U.S. And with the Tropomy satellite, it's reasonable spatial resolution. It's not, you know, perfect, but we're looking at about three and a half by five and a half square kilometer grids um, based on the measurements. So this, this figure shows measurements of formaldehyde, and this is over the ozone season 2018 to 2019. An average. And so this also gives you a hint of some of the disadvantages, which is that you really, to get meaningful data, need to average over um, longer time periods. So, yeah, then disadvantages, yeah, limited temporal resolution. The satellite goes over once daily at 1.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we're looking at column measurements, so everything between the satellite and the ground. So we're not directly measuring what's happening at ground level. Most of formaldehyde, and especially most of the NO2, is at near ground level, but it's not right there. Um, and they do have, the two pollutants have different vertical distributions. So NO2 is especially concentrated near the surface, whereas formaldehyde is more spread out through the column. And as I kind of mentioned here, you, you have to really have to average the data over many days in order to account for gaps. You know, if you have clouds, you're not going to get a measurement. Um, there's a lot of noise, particularly in the formaldehyde retrievals as well. And there are a bunch of assumptions and approximations that need to go into, um, you know, taking what the satellite sees and converting it into a column measurement of formaldehyde or NO2. That said, great spatial coverage. And you can see here in the formaldehyde measurements, you can see kind of down in the Ozarks in Missouri and down to Arkansas, you know, you can see these places where we have much higher formaldehyde levels than in other places. So if we take this data, um, oh, and yeah, and again, this is a collaboration with Brad Pierce and Gerald Ockton at UW Madison. Um, what I'm looking at now is I'm going to show Chicago at exceedance days. So only looking at days when ozone exceed, exceeded 70 ppb. 
in Chicago um, in these two years. And the data, um, Brad and Gerald gridded the data to lag host 12 by 12 kilometer model grid cell um, for kind of easier comparison with the modeling. So this shows the NO2 distributions. We see this really big hotspot over Chicago. This is formaldehyde distribution. It's more even. You don't really see, you, you know, there's a little bit of a hot spot here, but you don't see, um, it's not as obvious as in the NO2. I also know that Gerald and Brad have done some, um, some corrections to their retrieval over the lake to correct for, they think some, this is some biases. Um, I will be getting those data, but don't have them yet. And then what you can do is just take the um, formaldehyde to NO2 and ratio them. So it's formaldehyde to NO2 ratio. Um, and what we see is this really big, um, I'll call it a hot spot, but it's an area of really low ratio um, right over Cook County, right over Chicago. And this is driven mostly by the NO2 here. Um, the ratios then increase, you know, as you go farther away from Chicago, we have a little bit of an area over Milwaukee, a little bit of a lower ratio as well. And then what we can do is we apply the ratio thresholds um, from the Gin et al paper that, that I mentioned before. And if we do that, we can then take and kind of stick these into bins based on whether they're in the VOC sensitive, transitional, or NOx sensitive range. And what we see is this really big VOC sensitive area sitting right over Chicago. It basically covers Cook County, extends into Indiana, a little bit over the lake. Um, that's surrounded by a kind of donut of transitional chemistry and then NOx sensitive chemistry basically everywhere else. A little bit of transitional chemistry up in Milwaukee, a little bit kind of along the southern Wisconsin lakeshore. So that's kind of what we get from that. And then what we can do is we can look at the different areas. So I was showing the data for Chicago and Chicago exceedance states, but we can compare it to exceedance states in other areas. And what we see is that in Chicago, of all the areas, the attainment areas and maintenance areas in the lag curve region, Chicago has the most VOC sensitive chemistry. That's you know consistent with what we saw in the ground monitoring ratios. Detroit also has you know, a significant amount of VOC sensitivity. Uh, none of the other areas do, which is interesting. So it's really only Chicago and Detroit that have VOC sensitive chemistry. You know, Cleveland, St. Louis, Western Michigan don't even have any transitional chemistry according to this measure. Um, whereas the Wisconsin Lakeshore, Louisville, Cincinnati have a little bit of transitional chemistry. And we already talked about this. So then we're going to shift gears again and look at the modeled formaldehyde to energy ratios. So advantages of this, similar to what we saw, saw for satellites, we have excellent spatial coverage. We have great temporal resolution as well because the model outputs um, numbers every hour. And we can look at changes over time. We have, you know, normally we're doing modeling with a base year and a projection year, and we have multiple modeling scenarios. So I've actually looked at 2016, 2020, 2028. I also have 2023 data, but I haven't processed it. So, Angie, bef before yes. you move on, I have a clarifying question about the um, <clears throat> the ground based ratios. A yeah. question around what the the time periods were that you used to calculate those. Yeah, it's a good question. I use twenty four hour averages. Most of the measurements of formaldehyde were twenty four hour averages, so I felt pretty limited by that. So everything's a twenty four hour average. I averaged NO two to twenty four hours before I ratioed it. Yeah, yeah, so then there's some discussion around in the chat that, you know, that's going to have an impact on yeah. the ratio. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's actually, um, if you um, go back a ways, where I showed the different thresholds, that's actually the probably the main reason why the ground monitoring ratio thresholds that we use from Blanchard are so low, is because they're 24 hour averages, so they include overnight when the ratios are tend to be lower. So that that's a that's one of the big reasons why these ratio thresholds are much lower. But yeah, it, it, it's it's definitely a limitation. Um, it's just sort of what we have available with the data. And uh, Brad Pierce and Gerald Octon in a um, in a in the uh, contract work they did for us, they looked at um, they looked at some of the during the Alamos campaign where we had hourly, I think, from maybe more frequent than hourly formaldehyde measurements, they they looked at the impact of doing that averaging. You know, if you take a, you know, I don't know if they did five minute, but five minute, one hour, 24 hour average, they, they looked at the impact of that on the ratios and it yeah, has a very big impact. So um, can I move on? Okay, I'll move on. So looking at the modeled formaldehyde to NO2 ratios, um, I think already, yeah, I can look at 
I already went over this. Disadvantages of the modeling is that it's not based on direct observations of the atmosphere. You know, there are many assumptions and approximations that go into the modeling. And it's difficult to verify the accuracy of model ratios because we just don't have the observations. That said, what we do um, is we we make we calculated formaldehyde to NO2 ratios like this. This is Chicago exceedance days again. This is for 2020, um, not considering the pandemic. And we can apply the racial thresholds in this case from Duncan et al. paper. Um, and these are these are for um, after hours of peak and peak ozone. So I think this is like one to four p.m. I believe local time. Um, and we get something that looks very similar to what we saw for the satellite um, based on the model in, over Chicago. We have this area of VOC sensitivity over Chicago surrounded by a slightly wider area of transitional chemistry than we saw with the satellite. Up in Wisconsin Lakeshore, it's a little different. There's much more VOC sensitivity from the model than what we saw from the satellite. But very similar over, over Chicago. And what we can do with this is because we have measurements for different time periods, um, we can look at the changes over time. So like I said, I did 2016, I did 2020, which was a projection, so it wasn't including the pandemic, and 2028. And so these are the ratios, box, box plots, the median value is the line in the middle of the box plots. A little bit of a hint down here for how to read this if you want more, but um, what we see is that for each of the different non-attainment and maintenance areas, and again, VOC sensitive is low, NAP sensitive is high. Um, over time, we're getting less we're moving up we're getting less VOC sensitive more NOx sensitive over time we also see that Chicago as we saw with the satellite Chicago is the most has the lowest ratios uh, the closest to VOC sensitivity in this case the median value is in the transitional range for 2016 2020 and kind of right at this boundary in 2028 um, and then Western Michigan St. Louis and Louisville all had the highest ratios uh, where the most and where the median values are not sensitive in all the time periods. And you can't really see it from here, the, but the ratios are lowest in the city centers and they're they're also relatively low along the Lake Michigan and Erie Lake like Erie Lake Shores. And then if we apply the ratio thresholds again, these are from the Duncan et al paper. Um, we see as you know, as we've mentioned before, we see the most I don't have the key here, but uh, the gray is VOC sensitive. Uh, most VOC sensitivity in, in Chicago followed by Detroit, but unlike what we saw for the satellite, we do have areas of VOC sensitivity in all of the non-attainment areas right here, so early afternoon. Um, yeah, there's the key. Um, and we do see that over time, the areas of VOC sensitive, sensitivity are shrinking in all the areas so that, you know, Western Michigan, St. Louis, Louisville have, you know, a lot of these areas have very little VOC sensitivity by 2028. And if we compare this to the satellite estimates, we see more VOC sensitivity. You know, there's, there's some VOC sensitivity everywhere, like I mentioned. So we see more VOC sensitivity than the satellite does. And the satellite and model compare the best for Chicago and Detroit. I actually think there's some issues with the Duncan thresholds. I think it's time for, I really hope someone will revisit those thresholds. So it's, you know, 13 years old at this point. And I think that the thresholds are probably a little too high, too low. Uh, they're, they're off. Um, I'll return to that at the very end. And then the, the last thing I'm going to talk about with the model analysis, uh, just because there's there's a lot to get through, but if we look at the changes in ozone projected from 2016 to 2020 and 2028, we see um, the largest changes projected in grid cells that are NOx sensitive and transitional. And we see significantly smaller, you know, considerably smaller reductions projected in areas that are VOC sensitive. And that makes sense because what's happening, what's happening over this time is that we're, we're modeling larger reductions in NOx emissions than in VOC emissions. So if you're sensitive to VOC emissions and VOC emissions aren't decreasing that much, it makes sense that the ozone wouldn't decrease as much. Now I'm going to shift gears. So we've been talking about formaldehyde to NO2 ratios so far. I'm going to shift gears to a really different kind of analysis, which is this weekday weekend analysis. And this is based on a kind of jumping off from an analysis published by Sally Pusetti and Ron Cohen in 2012. And I mean, a lot of people have done weekday weekend analysis, but this is sort of I'm jumping off from their analysis. 
And the fundamental idea is that NOx decreases significantly on weekends, mostly because of reduced, reduced traffic, especially diesel traffic. Um, whereas VOCs are relatively unchanged from weekdays to weekends. So the idea is we're using this natural experiment, natural experiment that happens every week to get at um, ozone formation chemistry. So relative to weekdays, weekends, NOx decreases. And then if your ozone also decreases on weekends, um, so NOx goes down, ozone goes down, that's a good indication that you're NOx sensitive. Whereas if your ozone increases when you're NOx goes down, it's a good indication that you're VOC sensitive or NOx saturated. So we're going to try to look at this, these differences to get at the chemistry. The advantages is that we're relying primarily on ozone monitoring data, which is relatively widely available. And it is also looking at direct measurements of how the atmosphere is behaving. And you're not requiring complex models. Um, and it does allow examination of how ozone formation sensitivities change over time because we have you know, ozone measurements going back you know, quite a while. Disadvantages is that it's it's not that simple to tease out the signal from you know the changes in NOx emissions. There's a lot of other things that can a lot of variability in the atmosphere. So you have to account for meteorological impacts. When I first did this analysis, I didn't, and the data were were not that meaningful. So you have to account. Most studies have accounted for temperature. Or just look at high temperatures. I actually found that because our area is so dependent on transport. Um, you know, especially around the lake, uh, Lake Michigan and other areas too, that we really had to account for winds and other factors. So I, I did a somewhat more complex way to account for meteorological impacts. You also probably have to average over many years in order to see meaningful signals just because there's so much variability. So what I did was I looked at only ozone conducive days to control for meteorology. And I did that by running a CART analysis. I don't have time to get deeply into this, but this is a classification and regression tree analysis that basically takes the meteorology on all that we, we input something like 60 met parameters um, and it, it groups them based on meteorology, separates, uh, looks at the meteorological parameters that cause, lead to the greatest differences in ozone. Um, and then I looked at the day types and you get day types like you get a day type with, you know, temperatures over 75 you know, degrees Fahrenheit and southerly winds greater than, you know, five miles an hour and relative humidity less than 50% or something like that. And that's one of your nodes. So I then chose these or these day types. I chose day types that had mean ozone greater than 60 parts per billion. The days I'm looking at account for roughly 20% of all days and roughly 80% of max exceedance days. So it did a pretty, I think it does a pretty good job of separating out ozone conducive days. I combined multiple years and multiple monitors in order to get enough data to make meaningful comparisons. I'm not actually sure that I needed to combine the monitors. I think the original approach I was taking, it made more sense. Um, I may go back and, and not do that and look at um, just combining multiple years, which I think is crucial. Um, and I pulled, so I pulled data into four bins of five years, so looking over 20 years. So we have four um, five-year bins. And combine monitoring data from nearby monitors, two to four nearby monitors that have similar patterns in ozone and credences. You can see some more details down here. So, for example, I'm going to go through what I did for Cincinnati um, as an example. So, um, for Cincinnati, I averaged these, I combined these two monitors, which are both relatively near downtown, which is kind of located around here. And then these three outlying monitors, which had um, followed similar patterns, although they actually had different concentrations. And what we see then, this is a mean MDA8. Again, this is each five-year period averaged together. We have the weekday measurements in dashed lines, the weekend measurements in the solid line. Uh, the red is for the central monitors and the blue is for the outlying monitors. So what we see in, in for Cincinnati in all of the years, uh, the weekday had higher um, mean MDA8 than the weekends. So what I'm really interested in is actually the difference between the weekday and weekend. So weekday minus weekend. So that's actually what I'm going to look at for the rest of the time. So this difference is plotted here. It's about three um, part per billion difference in this time period. And what we see then um, for central area is that they're mostly lower. The differences are mostly smaller, um, but the differences are positive for all of the um, all of the years in both areas. So 
if we then interpret this, so the positive values are NOx sensitive, that you have more ozone on weekdays um, when you have high NOx, that's NOx sensitive. Negative values are VOC sensitive, you have more ozone on weekends with low NOx. Um, this is my best guess at a transitional range, and I don't have time to go into that, but um, it's sort of, I'm guessing it's negative one to one um, differences. So what we see then um, is that Things were knock sensitive basically all time periods in Cincinnati, but more strongly knock sensitive in the outlying areas, whereas the central area closer to downtown um, is looking more closer to a transitional range. Um, I did a significant test using a Welch's T test, and the significant values are shown in the circles. So we see that that many of these measurements were significantly. Th this is a significant difference between the weekday and weekend averages. So what we conclude here is that Cincinnati um, was both the downtown and outlying areas were not sensitive to kind of all of these time periods and with the central area being closer to um, transitional range. And th this conclusion compares pretty well with the model on satellite where we're finding most of Cincinnati is you know, pretty, pretty not sensitive with a little bit, possibly a little bit of transitional chemistry right in downtown. Chicago is a really different story. This is the values for Chicago. Um, we had, I, I combined data into five different regions around Chicago, uh, which are color coded here. And what we see is that um, in the early 2000s, all of the regions were ne had negative weekday weekend differences. So they were all in the VOC sensitive range. Most of them were significantly so. The, the, remember the circles imply, um, indicate uh, significant differences. So we're starting off very strongly VOC sensitive around the whole region. And they're all transitioning very, very clearly towards NOx sensitivity. And they actually all end up with positive differences in the late 2010s. Um, the, the, the difference in the Indiana Lakeshore is actually significantly different. None of the other ones are. And the mid lake, which is these three monitors right along the lakeshore, um, these are in the transitional range. So that's a really different story than what we saw for Cincinnati. But if you think about what we saw in the model and the satellite, you know, those were showing this big VOC sensitive area over Chicago. So this is in accordance with that. Um, although, you know, this is showing things that things are currently more NOx sensitive. And this is actually the only measurement that really suggests that there's a lot of NOx sensitivity in Chicago in the recent time period. So I think there's there's some bias in here. Um, my guess is that might be some meteorological differences that my approach didn't account for, but I'm not not entirely sure. So if we then look at the the differences plotted here, where where the cool colors indicate NOx sensitivity and the warm colors indicate VOC sensitivity, if we look back at the early 2000s around the whole region, we see you know the only place where we have really really strong VOC sensitivity is Chicago. That's cons consistent again with our other um, model and satellite measurements. Um, some areas of VOC sensitivity extending around Lake Michigan, a little bit in Cleveland. Other areas are mostly looking, you know, transitional to NOx sensitive. And if you look at it in the most recent time period, the late 2000s, 2010s, um, pretty much the whole region has shifted to transitional to VOC sensitive. Um, interestingly, this analysis shows a little bit of a touch of VOC sensitivity in the Cleveland Lakeshore which is unusual. Um, Cleveland has been a little confusing in this analysis. We've got some contradictory um, inputs here. But we have you know, the same movement we've seen with, with uh, the modeling that we're shifting from more VOC sensitive to more NOx sensitive. And this generally compares pretty well with the, you know, if we're looking at the latest time period, it compares pretty well with satellite and model classifications the main difference is that the weekday weekend is, is saying that Chicago and Detroit are much less VOC sensitive than the other measures, and Cleveland is more VOC sensitive. So then this last approach I'm going to talk about is um, honestly something I, I kind of threw together uh, myself based on some intuition inspired some by, by um, some work in the Jen 2020 study I mentioned earlier. Basic idea. So weekday weekend, we're looking at the impact on ozone from changes from weekday in NOx and changes to um, between weekdays and weekends. So here we're basically looking at the impact on ozone in response to changes in NOx 
with distance away from the city center and over time. So this shows these are these are based on the model, um, but we see Knox concept. Well, this is based on model. This is based on measurements. We see changes in NO2 concentrations as you move away from the city center. City center is defined as the location of the town hall in the city, which is in all cases right downtown. So we see, you know, NO2 drops off very sharply as you go away from the city center. And it's dropping off over time as well, not as sharply. There's a big sharp drop in the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s with implementation of a bunch of NOx control programs. But we have, you know, large reductions in NO2. And the, the, the important thing is that the reductions with the same kinds of trends in VOC, but they're much smaller. So the change in VOC concentrations with distance from the city center is about half that of NO2. And the, um, it's hard, we don't have good measurements of VOC, so it's hard to do a similar plot of VOC concentrations. So I looked at VOC emissions, which is in a great perfect proxy. Um, but the reductions, relative reductions in NO2 concentrations are you know, quite a bit larger than the VOC emissions. So um, because NOx reductions are larger than the VOC reductions, we expect they'll mostly be driving the differences, but VOC changes are also going to have an impact, so we have to consider them. And I'll talk about them more in a bit. So the basic idea is of what we're looking for. Um, you can get that, that from this plot of ozone versus NOx. Note that I flip the, the, the x-axis is opposite of the way you normally see this figure. So normally you see low NOx going to high NOx. But in this case, I want to look at distance from city center here going away from city center and early years going to later years. So I flip the the um, X axis. This is um, I should have put the attribution. This is modified from a figure in Pusedi and Cohen uh, 2012 paper. Um, but what we see is that um, we see how ozone is changing as NOx changes. And what we see is that when things are VOC sensitive, and you decrease NOx, you're going to get increases in ozone. And when you reach the transitional range, that's actually the area of peak ozone. And ozone doesn't change that much as NOx decreases in the transitional range. But then as you shift to NOx sensitive, as you continue decreasing NOx emissions, uh, your ozone falls off really sharply. So that's kind of what we're looking for is, is ozone de increasing flat or decreasing as your NOx is decreasing, you know, away from the city center and over time. Complications, of course, is that VOCs are there as well and are changing as well. So as you shift from high to medium to low VOCs, your curve is shifting down. So that's we're going to have these both happening at the same time. So basically, if you have VOCs decreasing as we will over time, it's going to basically flatten things, make uh, shift everything downward. So if you're in VOC sensitive, it's going to flatten the response rather than this kind of response to get more of that kind of response. If you're transitional, it's going to make you look, you're going to have decreases on top. So it's make you look more NOx sensitive. If you're NOx sensitive, there may be no impact because it's not sensitive VOC changes, or it may exaggerate this curve. So we need to consider this in their interpretation. And I'm not going to talk a lot about how I consider this, but I, I did in the, in the report. So the advantages of this approach are basically the same as for weekday weekend analysis. We're primarily relying on the ozone monitoring data, relying on direct measurements of how atmosphere is behaving, and we can look at changes over time. Disadvantages is similar to weekday weekend. There's a lot of different things that can um, affect ozone over space and time, and so it can be hard to find the signal. So you have to average over many years. Um, it often doesn't provide an unambiguous answer, so it does require, I think, a, some expert knowledge. And I, I really think this approach is best in combination with other approaches. I think if you tried to just look at this um, in isolation, it'd be really hard to be very confident in your conclusions. But I think in combination with other approaches, it's pretty useful. So this shows the this shows St. Louis. So the city center defined by the town hall is right as this, this black triangle. These are all the monitors that were operating in the early 90s. These are those in 2016 color coded by ozone. So what we see is back in the early 90s, we had areas of titration right in the central city. Um, very pretty strong indication of VOC sensitivity and you know, NOx suppression at that point in time. And we had higher concentrations in outerlying areas. 
we fast forward, you know, 25, 30 years, um, we don't see that kind of pattern. Ozone's lower everywhere, with fairly uniform concentrations. So a more useful way to look at this is by looking at, you know, distance from the city center. These are in 10 kilometer bins and, you know, time. We have this five year bin here as well. Uh, there's a lot of squiggles here, so it's very complicated, but um, distance from the city center were color coded by years. So what we see here is that the, the center part of the city in the early 90s had really low ozone, lowest ozone of the whole area. And then as you go out a little bit, it was higher. Um, and then we reached a peak, you know, out around 20 to 60 kilometers, and then things kind of fell down. Um, you know, there's not a lot of measurements out there, but um, if you go fast forward five years, we see lowest concentration in the center, but things increase kind of faster. It's not as low as it used to be. And then by the next year, it's, it's flatter. We don't have as big a as big a um, big a dip here. Um, you can look at the same data. This is the exact same data, but plotted where the line now is looking at the zero to ten range you know, for the red. So we see lowest concentration in the early years, increasing, increasing, and then decreasing really nicely. So we see everywhere has been decreasing pretty nicely since the early 2000s. There's you know, some variability, but that's some of that has to do with monitors coming on or going away. Um, so this dip in the early part of the, the, the study period in the central city is a pretty strong indication that we had not, uh, VOC sensitivity. We had some titration, which we see here in the early 1990s. That seems to be gone, seems to be transitional by the, the early 2000s and then you know, decreasing nicely after that. So um, we can see this nice transition from VOC sensitivity to transitional to NOx sensitive here. Um, a kind of shorthand um, using this approach for what's happening most recently is to just compare what happened in the early 2010s to the late 2010s. And if you have increases in ozone, which is the purple values, if you had ozone increasing during that period, it's a pretty good indication that you're VOC sensitive. If you had decreases, you're probably transitional or NOx sensitive. And what we see if you look at all the different areas is that um, most of the areas had or green. They're, they had decreasing ozone concentrations over that time period, which suggests you know transitional to NOx sensitive. But Chicago had ozone increases over that time period. Most of the area, not some of the outer lying areas here. Um, so that's again an indication in, in support of all the other indications we have that Chicago has VOC sensitive chemistry. Um, at least over the last decade. We also see this one monitor in Toledo um, that also has had increasing ozone. So I think the real strength of this approach is that I've looked at things five different ways. And so I have a lot of different, you know, every measurement approach, every analytical approach has limitations and issues. But I think by combining them and considering these other studies I'm going to mention down here, uh, we can get kind of a pretty good best estimate of what um, ozone formation chemistry is in the different areas. So um, when I do this, I'm giving the greatest weight to studies that are based in monitoring data because they don't require these really you know, complex algorithms or model assumptions. Um, but I am definitely considering the model results as well and satellite results. Uh, there are a bunch of other studies I mentioned. There's several using HGDM modeling from US EPA and a lab co-contracted with Georgia Tech as well. Um, we contracted with Charlie Blanchard to do some GAM modeling, a general, generalized additive modeling, and uh, Michael Vermeule and Tim Bertram at UW-Madison published a really nice paper and then also did some follow-up work um, under contract to us as well. Um, and then Miriam Abdiaskwe from Iowa um, did some nice work connected to Almas. Um, doing some photochemical modeling for the Lake Michigan area. So I'm not going to talk explicitly about these, but they're in the in the report. So what I have in the report, and I'm not, I don't have time to go over this for all the different areas, but this is showing an example for St. Louis. So we see what the results for the satellite, triple mean satellite, the CAMEX model, trends analysis, monitor ratios, weekday weekend analysis. And what we see is that you know the satellite suggesting that St. Louis area is entirely NOx sensitive. Models suggesting that there is an area of VOC sensitivity and some transitional chemistry. Trends analysis is suggesting you know, VOC sensitive or transitional. 
monitor ratio is finding it somewhere in the transitional range and weekday weekend is suggesting knock sensitivity. So if we take all of this together, it's pretty, pretty clear that most of the area is knock sensitive. This is kind of the one outlier, the model's one outlier. Um, it also seems likely that there's a small area right in the city center that is, you know, this is suggesting transitional is saying VOC sensitive. My guess is it's probably transitional. Like I said, I think the model, the thresholds I used are a little off for the, for the model. Um, and ozone in the St. Louis area is continuing to decrease nicely. So we expect that to continue. continue. And if you look at the historically the historical data from the trans analysis and weekday weekend, you know, there was an area that seemed to be VOC sensitive in the early 1990s. And we can also use these com this comparison to try to evaluate the different study approaches. So I already mentioned that the model seems to overestimate VOC sensitivity. Satellite seems to overestimate NOx sensitivity. It's not finding any transitional chemistry, which I think is there here. And I think same thing with weekday weekend analysis. The weekday weekend analysis, that might be partly because I'm, I'm combining monitors. I suspect that maybe like this one monitor in central uh, St. Louis might show um, some transitional chemistry if I were to pull it out. If we look at the results for Chicago, then we see, you know, satellite model are finding VOC sensitivity, trends are suggesting VOC sensitivity, monitor ratios are more transitional range, weekday weekend is the odd liar, um, the outlier. Um, that's suggesting mostly NOx sensitivity. So I think it's it's pretty clear from this analysis, central, maybe 60 kilometers or so of Chicago is, I think probably VOC sensitive, but shifting towards transitional, maybe kind of on the boundary between those two. Definitely some VOC sensitivity. Um, I think we're approaching probably that area of peak ozone towards transitional. Areas outside that central area, you know, this area here in Wisconsin that has had traditionally the highest ozone concentrations in the Chicago area, their concentrations are coming down. They're looking like they're transitional to NOx sensitive. And we, you know, we find ozone is increasing in the central city, um, but decreasing in these outlying areas. And expect that you know, eventually concentrations in the city are going to peak as we shift you know, away from VOC sensitivity and down that curve. And historically, the you know, city was even more VOC sensitive in the early nine, in the 90s and 2000s. So I don't have time to step through all the analyses for all the different areas, but the upshot is shown here in this table where we have Basically, all the cities, almost all the cities are knock sensitive with transitional chemistry downtown. Louisville, um, it may be entirely knock sensitive. There may be some, there's some indications there might be transitional chemistry, but it's less certain than the other areas. Detroit has some transitional chemistry up to the northeast. Cleveland has some transitional chemistry along the lake shore. Chicago is the, the odd duck with a, a large VOC sensitive area. So if we're thinking about kind of synthesizing everything. We see most of the, the lag curve region, including the non-attainment areas, most of the areas are knock sensitive. Um, downtown areas, large cities are mostly transitional, you know, Chicago being the outlier. Um, everywhere shifting to less VOC sensitivity towards more knock sensitivity. And we see that ozone concentrations are continuing to decrease in most areas in response to emissions reductions. Again, central Chicago being the outlier. So implications for control strategies, um, because most of the non-attainment and maintenance areas are NOx sensitive, they're mostly going to respond best to continued NOx reduction, reductions, which is you know, the, main, the main strategy that most of us are working towards. Transitional areas are going to respond to both NOx and VOC emissions reductions. So if we keep targeting NOx emissions reductions in those areas, they should respond. Uh, Central Chicago is going to respond best to parallel reductions in both NOx and VOC emissions. If we just go after NOx, we could, um, we'll probably continue to get increases in ozone for in the short term. Um, but if we really can get VOC and NOx emissions reductions at the same time, we could counter that. We could really pull things down. And eventually that area is going to be responding to NOx emission reductions. So we don't want to skip NOx emission reductions because um, we'd really pay for that down the road. Then the last thing I want to say is um, in evaluating the different approaches, you know, with all these different approaches, then look at kind of my estimates of what their apparent accuracy is. And it seems like the model, I already kind of mentioned the model approach seems to be most VOC, too VOC sensitive. 
week to weekend seems to knock sensitive. Most of the rest of them were pretty good. So I think the best ones are probably ground based ratios, satellite based ratios, trends analysis when used in conjunction with another approach. HEVM modeling, if you can do it, which is very complicated to do, but if you can do it, it's, it seems really good. Um, and as I've mentioned, I think we need a new evaluation of model-based formaldehyde to NO2 ratio thresholds. Um, I think the Duncan thresholds seem too high for, at least for a lab coast modeling data. So with that, I will wrap it up and would love to take questions.